Welcome back for the first half of the third part, which will be nurturing, imitation, and empathy. Now, Charlie talked extensively last night about the capacity of human beings to be loving and kind and caring and compassionate. And these are gifts that have been given to us by Christ simply because of the capacity that came with the human brain that we received. All 100 billion neurons, all 1 million to the 1 millionth power connections that exist between them on off switches. The complexity transcends that of the universe. But within that human brain is the capacity to live and love as Christ loved. No exceptions. We have every neuronal pathway, every biochemical, every hormone, every synapse that we need in order to live the life of Christ in peace and harmony with one another. That's a given. And there have been some questions about you know, why the science and the theology? Well, we have heard so much angst about this willingness of human beings to put themselves in a position of loving as Christ loved to the extent that they reject the use of violence for any reason. So if we sincerely believe that violence is inconsistent with the love that Jesus taught, then intellectually, to some extent, we have to work that out because we're going to be up against a full facade of criticism simply by having that position. And it's not that the position is untenable with survival or with compatible human living. It certainly isn't. In fact, there is a magnificent story of a conscientious objector who was a medic during World War II who received the Medal of Honor because of his bravery. Now that's the highest award that one can get for participation in a military activity. But the military activity he participated in was rescuing fellow comrades under dire conditions. And no one else was willing to do what he did, to put himself at such risk. And that was recognized by his comrades in the army and by the recipient, becoming the recipient of the Medal of Honor. And I think he also won two bronze stars, which is a little bit lower down on the scale of medals for valor and courage, but it still is a wonderful award, a wonderful recognition for bravery. So we can go through the literature and find thousands of people that have done this. And Jesus gave us our example that it in fact is not unreasonable, that it's very reasonable. In fact, if you look at the human mind, if you look at human reason and logic, this is the only way to proceed. Because if we look at the sequelae that follow from violence, either with respect to the way our children develop or by the condition of the world as a result of participation in war, then it's a foregone conclusion that these particular kinds of activities are ultimately destructive. So we can just take an example of Iraq at this stage. Actually, in 2008, at the end of 2008, there were 5 5 million people in Iraq who had been displaced, either in the country or had to leave the country. 5 million. There were 1.2 million widows. There were five, this is at the end of 2008, that's not 2010, 2011. There were 5 million orphans. And there were over 1 million people killed and classified as excess deaths. That means if the war wasn't going on, they wouldn't have died. But you can never count the number of people that have died as a result of some disease or some uh, malnutrition that existed, for example, in the midst of a pregnancy, or the severe stress that the mother was undergoing as as a bomb exploded near the house and the percussion wave caused her to spontaneously abort her child. These are the kinds of things that aren't measured to the degree that they should be measured. So if you do that, if you, if you look at war as more an abstraction, look at the reality of what's going on in war. Look at the reality of what's going on when a parent hits his or her child. 
or even for that matter, hollers at his or her child. If you look beyond that, you can see that what you're doing is undermining the intrinsic neurobiology that is in fact your brain. One of the most eminent biologists that ever lived, and some people like him, some people don't like him, his name was Charles Darwin. If you look at the later works of Charles Darwin, he, first of all, did not use the term survival of the fittest. If you look at his later writings, what Darwin meant by survival was those human beings who were in fact the most compassionate and empathic. That's what he was talking about when he was talking about survival in his context, not the English philosopher Spencer who coined the word survival of the fittest. So even the neurobiological literature today is saying, you know, forget survival of the fittest, it's really kindness that counts. So if you think you're on the wrong track following Jesus, you should be aware, and you probably are, of the incredible capacity we have to be good and to do good. And those capacities far transcend any of the other capacities that we have because they are located in the highest part of the brain, which is not only the smartest part of the brain, but it's the part of the brain that has the capacity to regulate lower areas of the brain. So they now know today, for example, if someone is suffering from extreme fear, that they can actually have them meditate on the area of the prefrontal cortex, this is the part of the brain in the front, on the prefrontal cortex, and imagine that fibers are growing from that area of the brain down to the fear center of the brain. This is just a meditative state that people go in and it's not that they're unconscious, it's not that they're having some kind of euphoric event, it's just simply something as simple as breath awareness. But in the midst of that breath awareness, the consciousness that is that, there can be a change as a result of entering into this kind of activity. Centering prayer is another kind of activity that does essentially the same thing. And what happens is that they do a functional MRI where you can actually see a change in activity of the brain, or an MRI to actually see change in structure of the brain, you can actually see an increase in the number of fibers going from the area of the highest part of the brain to a lower part of the brain and, and attenuating the fear, having a direct effect on the fear. So when we talk about the mind, we're not talking about so much the brain. We're talking about the mind as a process that regulates the flow of energy and information in the brain. So what this person did, or what they're doing in this kind of treatment, is to actually have the person direct the flow of energy and information in the part of the brain that has to do with the regulation of fear. And if you repeat that time and time again, what happens is that you get neurons connecting to one another and actually producing an inhibition of the fear itself. So the one point here is that the brain is plastic. Until the day you die, the brain can change. Now, when I was taking my early science courses, early even neuroscience courses, the teaching was that you have X number of cells when you're born and you better take care of them because no new cells will be born. But now they know, even in very late age, that new neurons can form from stem cells in the brain that can replace some of the neurons that are lost. So we have that capacity throughout our entire life. So when someone is having mental problems, psychological problems, spiritual problems, there's always the potential for a change. And the change that we talk about is the metanoia, change of mind, change of heart. But the metanoia actually requires change in structure and function of the human brain. That's what real change of mind is. And that's why Paul had such a hard time. You know, why do I always keep doing the things I don't want to do? And I can't do the things I really want to do. So it takes patterned, repetitive stimulation of any area of the brain or any behavior that you want to change. You remember the first time you sat down at the typewriter and tried to type, all right? And then a couple months later, all of a sudden, everything is somewhat spontaneous. So pattern, repetitive, repetition, change motor neural networks in the brain that regulate 
the sensation that's involved in typing in the control, and now you can do it without looking at the keyboard anymore. Now you can do it to some extent without really thinking about it. We can do the same thing with kindness and care and compassion. We don't have to force it. We reach a state where we realize as a result of pattern repetitive stimulation that this works. At some level, it always works. Even sometimes unknown to us, and 10 years later, it works. So the person we were praying for, the person we decided to be kind to every time we saw them, the smile at them, and we thought we were getting no response from that person, 10 years later, they have a memory of this experience with us, and they decide just upon that experience to change the course of their life. So this is a powerful dynamic that we have available to us. So there's a question that we need to answer, and one is, how do nurturing and imitation influence brain development and subsequent emotional, behavioral, cognitive, and social functioning? And there are a couple facts that we need to just keep in mind. The brain has an amazing capacity to develop in a use-dependent fashion. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, as you saw Monday in the video, when they showed the dynamic presentation in the video of neurons connecting to one another, and the the example that was used was the phone call. That is, you had to make the phone call a number of times before that network in the brain could actually recognize where it was supposed to go quickly. So use dependence is very, very important. So for example, if a mother learns how to respond contingently to the needs of a child, that is, if a child is uncomfortable or complaining or seeming to be in distress, if the mother, first of all, recognizes the child, that is, makes some kind of communication that she's aware that the child's in distress, so this is contingent. The contingency is the distress of the child, and now the mother actually in some way responds to the child, but the response is timely and it is also efficacious. So just acknowledging the child without taking some kind of definitive action is not the contingent communication that's necessary for normal social, emotional, behavioral, and even physical development of the child. So every interaction with a child is an opportunity since the brain is growing so rapidly during this period of time and neurons are connecting at the rate of billions of times a second, new connections are being formed, that interactions that you have with a child at that time are harnessing the capacities that the child has. So if you respond to the child and the child is comforted by your response, What's going to happen in their brainstem is that there's a chemical called oxytocin that's released, and the oxytocin will help to shape that area of the brain in the sense that it will make that area of the brain allow the child to experience a sense of safety and security. And at the same point in time, it will dumb down, to some extent, the stress response. So the child will be less vulnerable to stress, And if they are stressed, they'll be able to recover from the stress much faster. So this is one of those kinds of behaviors that we're talking about is use dependent. So the more you do that for the child, the more that area of the brain will develop and the more the child will be able to comfort and soothe itself. And this happens very early on. You know, if you watch the mother coming to the child when she knows the child is hungry, the mother doesn't even have to reach the child. The child's, if, the, if this contingent communication is going on, the mother is walking into the room where the baby is, maybe just crawling around on the rug and kind of complaining a little bit, acting distressed, maybe hungry. The child will be soothed just by seeing the mother because the sight of the mother is enough to cause oxytocin release in the child And that particular hormone, protein, actually causes the baby to feel calm and comforted. And when the mother sees the baby calm down as a result of her presence, she also has an oxytocin release, and it increases the bonding affinity between her and the child. So this constant dynamic is going on in every interaction that we have. We have social brains. I mean, that's why our brain is so big. It's not because we do space shuttles. It's not because we do physics. 
This is because we have so many relationships. So you can chart the growth of the size of the human brain, and there's a direct correlation between the size of the human brain and the number of relationships that people had over time, you know, just being hunter-gatherers, and then you had larger and larger communities. So the more the community grew, in essence, the size of the brain increased to accommodate that. So as I said uh, on Monday, the primary, the largest area of the brain is designed for relationships. Now, the brain grows and organizes in response to developmental experience. I think we just covered that enough, so we won't belay that. And then the next one, the major modifier of all human behavior is experience, not genetics. It's experience. The experiences you give a child, the experiences we give one another of care and kindness and compassion are the major determinants. So they're just extremely important. So if you go to a country and you do some kind of relief mission versus you go to a country and do some kind of bombing mission, there's going to be an entirely different response to the people and there's going to be an entirely different result from both of those activities. So one allows the possibility for community, for sharing, for interaction, for growth. The other ultimately leads, if not immediately, to breakdown of the community because of the tremendous amount of loss it's experienced and suffering and basically everything else that goes along with it. So if you look at any war, you eventually find that that's the case. Even though someone always proclaims victory, the victory literally means that one side was suffering so much that they gave up. And they can't wait to get the chance for retaliation. We'll just compare World War I, World War II, and the position of the Germans after the end of World War I and what happened in World War II. And the, the fourth is that there is no more specific biological determinant than a relationship. So why do we have this particular area of the brain? Why do we have just our facial muscles? Because 80% of what we communicate when we're looking at another person comes through the face. So there are muscles in the face that allow, for example, when you smile, for certain, and it's a sincere smile for certain muscles to contract, it's not only in the area of the mouth, but also around the eyes. So much so that you can distinguish, if you look at a video, between a genuine smile and a service smile. You know, someone at McDonald's brings you hamburger versus, you know, someone gives you a cup of tea because you're suffering in the hospital. So there's a difference between the two. One's called a Duchenne smile because it's not really a sincere smile. But kids can detect that. Kids can read our faces in ways that we can't even begin to imagine because they have this ability to perceive what's going on because their filters are so fine as far as distinguishing what's going on with the face because of the interaction between the mother and the child or the father and the child or even you know, the siblings in the family and the child, but primarily the mother because of all the time spent you know, in nursing and feeding and that early development, like the first nine months. There's a book that was published recently called Origins and the subtitle was How the First Nine Months Affect the Rest of Your Life. So there's a lot that goes on in utero that determine the outcome for you after birth. And we all know that with respect to certain deficiencies, but one of the things that we talked about on Monday was the high cortisol levels in the mother can actually inhibit the growth of neurons and as a result of that, alter the structure of the cerebral cortex as a result of the high cortisol levels during pregnancy. And the last item on the list is early life experiences determine core neurobiology. So basically, the structure and the biochemistry of your brain are determined not so much by genetics, but to a far greater extent by experience. So if you are the experiential person for a child, the primary experiential person for a child, you are literally the architect of that child's brain. 
It's just an awesome responsibility. So when you think of a country that's experiencing war and they have five million orphans, it's absolutely certain that those orphans didn't get the care that they needed. And this goes on during pregnancy and especially during the first three years thereafter. Just let's visit a, um, a phenomenon called the vortex of violence. I think everyone's familiar with the term cycle of violence. And there's a term now that's used, it's called the vortex of violence. And it's not as well understood and not as well known as the, the cycle of violence phenomenon. And it involves the conservation of violence. So if we just look at, for example, an example of someone who feels, for example, helpless, frustrated, humiliated, overwhelmed, he's going to bring this, or she is going to bring this into interactions with others. And this could happen with a husband at work because he's not being acknowledged for the work he's doing or because he simply can't measure up and he feels frustrated and he comes home and in this vortex of violence, there's displaced aggression toward the, the wife or the children. And then as, as that uh, phenomenon progresses, what happens is that the weaker person in the link has a tendency to be the recipient you know, of the violence or of the frustration. So we're going from the most powerful to the least powerful. What this process cost and robbed, emotional, social, cognitive, and physical development is incalculable. And finally, the vortex of violence creates a pervasive sense of threat. And they refer to it as an incubator of terror for the developing child. So what happens in this context? What happens to the child that has to live in this vortex of violence? And the vortex is kind of hard to imagine from our point of view. But if you look at physiologically, psychologically, what happens to a child when dad hollers at the child, the changes in the stress response system, the changes in the levels of molecules that are responsible for that child being able to develop a sense of patience, kindness, and just interaction with other people is actually undermined. So, so you know, you talk to parents, they say, well, I have a right to holler at my child because they were doing something that was wrong. And then you have to think back to what we talked about as far as contingent communication is concerned. Contingent communication is not dominant to power. You holler because you know that there is some effect produced as far as producing fear in the child and getting them to conform to what you want them to do. But the overall effect on the child's brain is to make them or allow them or have them develop areas of the brain that are gonna diminish their cognitive and social and emotional capacities as well as their intellectual capacities. So it's not just the kid gets scared because of what you do or say, it's because in this particular case, it's damaging because you're altering brain structure and brain chemistry. And if this, as we talked about, is pattern repetitive repetition, that is, it goes on time and time again, then the child may come to exist in a state that's less than a relaxed and quiet state. I mean, their normal baseline state will be aroused when the parent's around rather than calm and, and um, feeling a sense of equanimity with the parent. So just a little picture of a vortex. So this is the, the illustration that's kind of used to describe the feeling of someone caught in a vortex. And that's simply the, you know, the, the dynamics of the air off the tip of a wing of a plane. So this is a crop duster and they put red powder on the field and the plane flew over it and this is what is actually created. So the NSA, or not the, the uh, NASA and the um, FAF, AA both use these studies to determine how much distance there should be between each plane before it takes off. So the vortex is really a powerful thing. If a child gets caught in a vortex, a lot of times their development is diminished to the extent that it becomes somewhat noticeable, but 
the parents are having a hard time or the parent is having a hard time determining why the behavior has changed in such a way that seems to be in contrast with what was designed by the behavior of the parent toward the child. Now there are, there's a long range of family factors and, and actually they're gonna be on the list that I give you and I'm not gonna go through them now. I'll just jump to the, uh, I'll jump to the next slide. So this chart, this graph shows what they call differential state reactivity. So if we look at states that people can be in, as far as human behavior is concerned, um, one state is calm, another state is vigilance, another state is alarm, another state fear, and another terror. And then everyone has kind of a, a baseline level so there's baseline, and then there's severe stress, and then there's trauma. So what they have found is children who are raised in this vortex of violence or raised where there's abuse or neglect um, or violence, either physical or sexual, that the baseline, if you look at it, normally is a state of alarm. So the baseline for a child that's living in under conditions that are very stressful to them and they are afraid or they're not being nurtured or a panoply of other things can be going on that are negative, this is where they start. So if they go to school and they haven't done their homework and the teacher calls on them, a normal student who is at calm at baseline wouldn't notice much of an effect as a result of being called on and not having their homework available. But this person who starts at alarm could very well go to a fear state or even a state of terror. So there's a little possibility for that up here, but this is where they, this is where they go to school at. So if you look at videos of kids that are in a state like this of alarm when they go to school because of the dynamics at home, you can actually watch the video and they're not really listening to the teachers. So the teachers up there teaching math and the kids thinking about what happened at home last night or they're vigilant about who's looking at them, someone going down the hall, you know, what are they thinking about me, you know, and all the dynamics around them as far as the other students are concerned, entertaining all kinds of negative thoughts about, you know, him or herself as a person. And what happens to, to um, kids that are raised in a really robust environment where they have a lot of stimulation, a lot of nurturing, they, they come to be resilient. So it really takes a lot to set them off and they can endure a lot of events that would literally cause someone to go into a state of fear or terror. So we talked just five minutes ago about when the mother responds to the child in a contingent manner and the child is being soothed and on a regular basis because of the behavior that the mother evokes toward the child, the child will be at baseline very calm. And even if they do get stressed, they will exhibit a stress response, but they'll come down. The mother will be able to, to soothe the child by holding the child or, or singing to the child. Now this is not 100%, but in general, this is the way that the nervous system works once the area of the brain has been set up to either be fearful or very vulnerable to stress or being very open to being soothed and being relaxed by a caregiver. So during this dynamic, what's going on is the higher areas of the brain are actually learning how to experience pleasure from interaction with other people. And as I think I mentioned Monday, those areas of the brain are the same areas of the brain that all the drugs of abuse basically hit, you know, the cocaine and heroin. Those are the pleasure centers. And a lot of this information about what happens when human beings interact in an affiliative way toward one another and the response of the pleasure centers of the brain all came from research on people that were addicted and looking at the areas of the brain that were affected. So one thought is that if you become dependent upon drugs that give you pleasure, 
there may be a point in your life or even currently where you're not able to derive meaningful pleasure from experiences with other people. So this is the wonderful part of it is that when you think about the mother and the child, for example, and you think about the interactions of the mother and the child, you know, having oxytocin remodel the brain stem so it's able to withstand stress and it's able to relax and then going up even further to another area that releases a chemical called dopamine that produces a sense of pleasure even up to another level that causes the release of our internal opioids, our internal narcotics, that produces a relaxing and tranquilizing effect. So this is the pathway that God gave us, you know, in order that we can enjoy the company of others and become so respectful of that capacity that even a thought of violence or even a thought of undermining someone's joy or happiness or tranquility um, becomes an, an almost an aversive thought. So rather than seeking revenge, you're looking for creative ways in order to activate the areas of that person's brain that might actually bring them to a better understanding of who you are and possibly how a relationship could exist between you. And once the remodeling has taken place, as far as going in the negative direction, you have to remember, just as St. Paul had to learn, that you need the pattern of repetitive stimulation. It's over and over and over again, because every time you stimulate a pathway, what happens is that neurons start to wire together. And when they start to wire together, they fire together. And if it's an area of the brain that's involved in your capacity, to experience another person as they're feeling at the moment, which is empathy, then you're going to be a more empathic person and you're going to be able to open up to other people and be able to see suffering where you never would have seen it before. Or if you see suffering and you saw it before, now there's a strong drive to alleviate that suffering rather than just acknowledge the presence of it. And if we move into another part of this dynamic, which is actually functioning in groups, and I'll run through this quickly, but when we look, about, when we look at what, we, what is known as sphere of concern, it's how broad is our circle of concern for other people? So is it the world? Is it the community? Is it the family? Is it self? Or is it body integrity, just the individual? And then sense of time, is it, are we looking into the future? Are we going back and looking at the past? All right, this is called um, insight, the ability to look at our autobiographical life and see what happened in the past and what our capacities are for the future, possibly. And then if you have a community or you have a person that sees things in days or hours, there's another way of looking at the world that's going on and specifically with the sense of time. So finally we get to the end when someone is living in a state of constant threat almost, the sense of time is just now. And what happens is that as you move across this continuum, you use different areas of the brain. So for example, if your sphere of concern is the world, then the area of the brain that's being used is the the neocortex is the newest part of the cortex or areas just beneath the cortex called the subcortex. And as we move across here, we'll see that as, as we decrease our sphere of concern, we have a decrease in the sense of time. We also have a decrease in our ability to respond. So one of the functions of the middle prefrontal cortex is response flexibility. That is, if you're in a tight situation, you can go through a panoply of options that allow you to pick one that would be most appropriate for that situation. So in this case, you'd be using a neocortex or the subcortex. If someone insults you and you start hollering at them or screaming at them or swearing at them or throwing things at them, then basically you're in the body integrity area and you're down at your brainstem. In fact, you're acting automatically. 
which is known as autonomic. So we have types of memory. One of them, there are two levels, main levels of memory. One of them is implicit memory. We've had experience in the, is experiences in the past, and when these memories are recalled, there's no recollection of that. So there are memories that we have in the brain that we can't recall like we recall normal memories. So if I'm having a bad experience when I'm three years old with a cat, and the cat scratches me, and I see a cat maybe two years later, I might experience a stress response just as a result of seeing that cat or another cat. So what happens is that implicit memory is nonverbal. That is, you can't express why you were afraid of that cat you never saw before, or now because you've been scratched three times, you're afraid of all cats. There's no way that the mind can explain that because this is not memory that's put in a place that can be worked with. This is just implicit memory, so it's nonverbal, and the individual has absolutely no sense that the internal experience that they're feeling at that moment has anything to do with an event in the past. So you may see someone you haven't seen for five years, and somehow you're really uncomfortable with that person. Why is that? So you try to remember, but basically, because it's implicit memory, it cannot be recalled. So implicit memory just exhibits itself sometimes, and we engender behaviors that are completely anomalous to who we normally are. And, and so the, these types of memories do not require conscious acknowledgement in order that they be encoded. And they don't use a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is very important for having recallable type memory. So the next line is cognition. If we look across the scale, we see we go from abstract to reflexive. So this is correlates with a part of the brain being used. And then we get back to the mental state we were talking about before. So the calm person, the, the person that's aroused, the person that's in a state of alarm, the person that's in fear, the person that's in terror. And then if we, we're not going to spend any time on this, but if we actually look at the social environmental pressures that exist, we can go down the chart and we can see all, all kinds of things. We can see all kinds of things that present problems. You know, it's, for example, if you have resource surplus and predictable, sustainable, you're innovative, and on the other end of the spectrum, you have a tendency to be reactionary. So it doesn't seem to make any difference where you pick this. There's a correlation between being resource poor and any number of these issues that go along as far as adaptive responses to threat in a living group. Now this um, title was in an article in Nature Neuroscience, and the article was about a book and it was called Born to be Good. And this was the whole hypothesis on which the book was written, Survival of the Fittest, you know, forget it. It's kindness that counts. And then the entire book actually used examples of the central nervous system being primarily designed to be good. I mean, that's the intrinsic design of the human nervous system. And as I said before, we have the capacities in all our neural networks in order to develop in a way, in order to allow our brain to express behaviors in a way that are a reflection of Christ-like love. But the most important piece of the whole thing is what happens in the early stages of development. Because if the first two or three years determine the basic neurobiology of our capacity for cognitive, behavioral, emotional, and even physical development, then what goes on there can really limit our capacity to express who we genetically were determined to be. So not only do we have the capacity to alter the biochemistry and structure of the brain, but we also have the capacity to alter the expression of genes in the child. Not that the gene has changed, but the expression of the gene has changed. 
Back to Darwin for a second. The capstone, capstone of his theory of evolution was the emphasis on moral sensitivity as the most important driving force in human evolution. Darwin argues, moral sense arises from parental and societal instincts that have evolved, particularly in humans. And then finally, this sounds strange coming from Darwin, <laughs> for some people, according to Darwin's notes, the moral sense gives rise to the golden rule and the second commandment given by Jesus. And this was written by um, Darcia Narvaez, who was a psychologist from the University of Notre Dame, studying the work of Darwin and looking at some of his writings with respect to human interactions, but in particular, empathy and compassion. Now, if we look historically at the whole idea of compassion, we, found that, we find that in many cases it's treated with derision. And it's actually hard to imagine who the person is that said this. Such benevolent compassion is called soft-hearted and should not occur at all among human beings. Immanuel Kant, probably the last person you'd expect to have that opinion. And then for others, it inspires awe. In this case, if you want to be happy, practice compassion. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. And that's the Dali. Now there are assert assertions about human nature that I grew up with, and I don't know how many of you grew up with them, but it's quite stunning that we seem to, at least in my neighborhood, ex accepted a lot of these, you know. Not that they were traits of ourselves, but just acknowledge that these are traits of other human beings and that these are in fact possibly dominant traits. So we have humans are selfish, greed is good. Well, depends on where you're working. Greed is very good in some institutions. Altruism is an illusion. Cooperation is for suckers. Competition is natural. War is inevitable. How many times have you heard that? War is inevitable. The bad in human nature is stronger than the good. So intrinsically, none of these are true. But developmentally, all of them can be true. And the perception that war is inevitable can be as solid in someone's mind as the earth is round. So the question is, what will become of Homo sapiens? What will become of the human race as far as our development is concerned, and how we interact and relate to one another. Well, there's still a lot of, although the, the idea that the brain will continue to increase in size has basically been abandoned, there are a lot of uh, biochemical and physiological and neural network changes that are taking place over time that point in the direction of the increased capacity for care and compassion once these neural networks are developed. So the, the architecture is there, but the connections need to be made and this pattern repetitive activity. And this is why, you know, the, the, our religion in particular is an incarnation of religion. You know, we say that we believe in Jesus, but the command is to love one another as I have loved you. So it's actually in the doing, it's actually in loving one another as Jesus loved us, that we come to the awareness that this is in fact something that is absolutely true. And the love that he talks about theologically has two irreversible dimensions. One of them is the willingness to suffer without the desire for retaliation. So that takes care of the violence part of it. The other is the willingness to serve without the desire for reciprocation. That takes care of Wall Street. <laughs> but these are, the, these are, when we say love, we're talking about agape, we're talking about Christ-like love. And these are two irreducible dimensions of that love. If you take either one away, you don't have Christ-like love. And if you look neurobiologically at the human being, we have the capacity to do that in extreme situations. So how does cooperation evolve? And this is the, this is the question that um, we'll just take a look at the last part here. How might compassion, awe, love, and gratitude, powerfully oriented toward enhancing the welfare of others, take hold within social communities governed by the pursuit of self-interest in such a fashion 
that they would become favored by natural selection and encoded into our genes and nervous system. So after this, there is, there's actually a series of um, studies that have to do with um, compassion itself. And I'm just going to um, kind of breeze through those and get to some other areas here. Now, what does, what does babies are us mean to babies are us, to the actual commercial chain? What does it mean? It means that the whole corporate energy, the whole corporate logo, so to speak, the logic is geared toward doing things to help babies grow or to help you care for your baby or walk your baby in the case of a stroller, whatever it happens to be. But when you look at it at a deeper level, babies are us is really saying, I mean, in the true sense, because the child is so vulnerable to its environment and because the development of the social, emotional, behavioral, cognitive, and even physical aspects of the child are dependent upon experience and the primary experience generator are adults in that child's life or younger siblings, but primarily the mother and father. So if you were to look at the cytoarchitecture of the brain, you would find you are having a reflection of the child's brain in the experiences that you provided for that child. And then if we go and we look at early experiences that the child has, we find that the formation of social attachments is critical component of human relationships. And then further infants begin to bond to their caregivers from the moment of birth these social bonds continue to provide regulatory emotional functions throughout adulthood. So this is not something that's transient. These are neural networks, neural pathways that are built up, and they provide us with the ground substance for a lot of our interactions with other human beings when we become adults. And then there are a number of molecules like vasopressin and oxytocin that are critical in the establishment of social bonds and the regulation of emotional behaviors. But we need the brain structure in order for that to happen. And what can happen during development is that as a result of the parent's interaction with the child or the child's interaction with the environment, you can actually have um, molecular cues that need to come online to regulate the development turned off. And so you have an alteration in a number of developmental areas one is actually the formation of new neurons. Another could be the migration of the neurons. As we saw Monday, when the neurons are born, they have to actually migrate till they get to the area in the brain that they need to be in in order to communicate. In addition to that, we have this capacity for differentiation. So once they get in a, super, a certain neighborhood, they develop a structure that allows them to function based upon some of the molecules that other neurons are releasing and molecules that are released by a type of cell called a glial cell, it's a support cell in the central nervous system. And then the other thing is the connections that they make between one another. Remember we said that there were about average of 10,000 connections between one neuron and another. That process is called synaptogenesis. So as a result of missing critical cues, that the child needs for development, these are some of the pathways that are actually affected. And these are major things that go on and determine brain development. So it starts to look a little bit more serious than maybe what we talked about earlier as far as developing pathways that have a sense of safety and security and that you have attachment between the mother and the child. These are very important developmental factors here that can affect all areas of the brain and all different functions of the brain. So the malorganization and diminished function abilities that result, you have specific neural systems where development has been disrupted and as a result of that, you have lifelong compromised functioning. So in some cases, this is not as transient as other causes of alteration in the nervous system are concerned. And if you want to change these, 
there has to be more pattern repetitive stimulation. Just as you have a habit for 15 years of doing something a certain way and you want to change it, it's very hard to do it overnight. So you have to substitute a good behavior for the behavior that was negative. And in the process of doing that, you start stimulating other pathways. And the pathways, as you saw in the video on Monday, that were involved in the negative behavior just start to diminish. But it takes time. So those connections, those synapses, those axons, those long fibers that connect one neuron to the other will actually start to recede. Just like when they talked about the phone network and some of the numbers were dialed and others weren't, and then it showed the neurons in the background just kind of fading away. Well, the same thing happens in the brain when you change behavior. You can actually have areas of the brain that were causing aberrant behavior be altered as a result of new behavior. And this just gets into um, just a very, very important aspect of modeling the brain of a child. And there are three important aspects of children watching violence on TV. So the first thing is that children become desensitized to the pain of others. The second thing is that they accept violence as a way to solve problems. And thirdly, they accept violence as a way to behave. So they would have a tendency to behave in more aggressive ways toward others. So where does this, where does this come in? Where is the input from this kind of alteration in brain structure? Is it coming in this case from nature or is it coming from nurture? So the television is an incredible nurturing tool and not necessarily in a positive direction. So in the case of nature and nurture, what they know is that the line between nature and nurture has been dissolved into what they call experience-dependent neuroplasticity. And, and plasticity is just this ability of the brain to change. So what's going on here is that experience causes the brain to change. And the structure of the brain, that is the neurons and the networks, and initially are the genetic part. And then as we develop, early life experiences really do determine neurobiology. And interactions with caregivers during early development establish the brain's cognitive and emotional circuitry. So let's just take a quick look at the interaction between neurons in the brain and genes. So this is a, what they call a four gene micronet. That is, there are four genes involved in this process that are gonna influence behavior in one way or another. So the first neuron that we're looking at is in the frontal cortex. The other one you see over here is in the hypothalamus. And this one is an area of the brain that's involved with fear and aggression. But it also has the capacity to evoke behaviors between others that are compassionate and that are, as we would term it, loving or caring. So it depends upon how they get activated and what molecules activate them, what kind of behavior you get from it. And so if we look down here, we see at the bottom a couple um, estrogen molecules. Now, both males and females produce estrogen. So what the estrogen does in this particular case is it will activate a gene either in the frontal cortex or in the hypothalamus. So here's the estrogen. And sex hormones like estrogen actually go into the nucleus of the cell and turn genes on. So this estrogen molecule will bind to a special site and then activate a gene. And as a result of the activation of that gene, so here's the site, the gene will be in the nucleus, so this will actually um, go into the nucleus, but it'll cause the release, it'll cause a synthesis of oxytocin. And then down here at the amygdala, you'll have another receptor for estrogen that'll turn on a gene in the nucleus of the cell, and the byproduct of that will be a receptor for oxytocin. So if we're looking for some kind of behavior to be, be produced by this particular neuron in the amygdala, whether it's aggressive or violent or fearful or whether it's kind or compassionate or caring, 
depends upon the ability of the hypothalamus to produce adequate levels of oxytocin. And if that happens, the oxytocin binds to the receptors here in the amygdala. The amygdala will not function as a fear-inducing, uh, aggressive site in the brain. It will instead release molecules that will result in caring and nurturing behaviors. So that's one way where genes can work together in order to produce a certain effect. And so if this system is upregulated, then there is a tendency for the amygdala not to be so aggressive and fearful and to some extent um, willing to participate in violence. And these pathways can be enhanced behaviorally. So we have one very, very important um, aspect of genetics now that we'll just, this will be the last thing that we'll do. And that's life experiences add molecular switches to genes. Now, as we saw in the last slide, genes need to be turned on in order that they can express what they were designed to express. So in that case, we saw estrogen going into a cell in the area of the brain called the hypothalamus, and then it activates a gene in the nucleus, and the gene in the nucleus produces a protein called oxytocin. In this case, we're gonna take a look at a chromosome so this is the chromosome. And then there are special proteins once the chromosome unravels, and this is what's going on, that the DNA is actually wrapped around and they're called histones. And this is the DNA itself. So this is just a double-stranded molecule. And the whole idea of the DNA is to provide a code for the synthesis of protein. So one of the proteins we could be talking about producing is a protein oxytocin, which this gene codes for, or it could be a receptor, like we saw in the amygdala, in this receptor that when activated will actually turn off the stress response. So the next step is what they call transcription, that is this double chain molecule splits, and then you have this particular area copied, and then that message is taken to another part of the cell that controls the production of the protein. Let's, let's imagine in this case, it's a protein that becomes a receptor that turns off the stress response. So that's what would function, that's how this gene would function normally. Once the gene is activated, then it produces a receptor that actually goes to an area of the brain that's involved in memory called the hippocampus. And it's involved in turning off the stress response, primarily by lowering the levels of cortisol, which is the main stress hormone in the blood. Now, if the child has been abused either physically or sexually, or neglected, what they have found is that there are extra groups that are added to the chromosome itself. And they impair the ability of this chromosome then to code for the receptor that turns off the stress response. Now, they found this in rats initially, and then they started to look at human brain slices of adolescents who had actually committed suicide. So in the studies of the rats, they're finding that mothers that licked and groomed their pups a lot, their pups were very affiliative, got along well with others, you know, we weren't really bothered by stress as much as the other pups. And that when they grew up, they basically did the same thing to their pups. So you have, this is an example of what they call transgenerational mutation, or inheritance really is probably a better word. So when they looked at the brain slices of the adolescents who committed suicide, there was a direct correlation between the number of these receptors that are responsible for turning off the stress response and the incidence of suicide. 
So the bottom line here is, and kind of what I've been to some extent driving at all night, is the way that we respond to one another determines the neurocytoarchitecture of the other as well as the neurobiochemistry of the other. So you can, by your smile, you can make someone release not only oxytocin, but also dopamine and endorphins and enkephalins. I mean, you can change your whole day. I mean, some days you're just down and someone comes by, you don't even know them, and they smile and they say, hey, how you doing? And you don't even think that you were doing pretty crummy before that happened, but the dynamic of the release of these molecules is so fast and the change in your response is so fast that sometimes you just stand there in awe that something as powerful as a smile or just a hello or an acknowledgement, just a look, you know, and you know that smile is sincere. And so it produces a whole kind of response in the body that makes the affiliation between those two people much stronger than it would have been otherwise.